Hey Prepters, welcome to this video. This is the first English module and then after this there are two more modules, the easy module and the hard module. I'm gonna link them both below and also up in the corner to make sure that you get the right one. After you watch this one, if this is your first time doing the test, make sure to watch the right module for the second so you don't get any spoilers or answers. Hope you enjoy the video! Hey Preptors, the SAT is going to become digital from March 2024. College Board has released some SATs, some in the paper format and some in the digital format. Today, we'll take a walkthrough through the reading and writing section of the first digital test. The first section is words in context. Words in context is basically fill in the blanks, where you fill in a word based on the context of the whole paragraph, right? And quickly, let's go through the Prepto way guys of going about it. Prepto way first of all is read the question so we know what question type it is. This is completing the text so it's words in context definitely. Then since it is words in context while reading you will read things differently based on the question type right. So since it is words in context you will not pay too much attention on proper nouns right. You will pay more attention on verbs, adjectives, transition words etc. So let's see, first question, researchers and conversationists stress that biodiversity loss due to invasive species is something, right? So we'll find a synonym for what can fit here and then we'll look at the options, right? So what is that something? For example, people can take simple steps such as washing their footwear after travel to avoid introducing potentially invasive organisms. So invasive organisms can be avoided. If they can be avoided, then loss due to invasive species can also be avoided. So a simple word that can fit in here is avoided, that loss can be avoided, right? And now we will look at options and see which option comes close to avoided. So preventable, preventable is work, will work, right? If something can be avoided, that means something is preventable. So we'll keep option A. Undeniable, undeniable is something that cannot be denied. And if it cannot be denied, that means it's a truth. And that is completely out of context here, right? We're not speaking about truth or false, right? Common, again, the paragraph is not about common and common. So option C is also incorrect and we'll strike that through. Option D, concerning. This may be concerning, but again, see the next sentence is not giving us any context of why it should be concerning. It is giving us context on how it can be avoided. Hence, D is also incorrect and the best answer here is option A. This question is more difficult than the earlier one. So let's see what it's about. Which choice completes the text? So it's a words in context. It is by no means something to recognize the influence of Dutch painter Bosch on Ali's paintings. Indeed, Ali himself cites Bosch as an inspiration. So Bosch definitely inspired Ali's paintings. So the influence of the painter Bosch was important. But since it is no means first, right? So I can say not important because of the negative, right? We are going to go for the opposite word. However, some scholars have suggested that somebody else may have also had some impact. But the Dutch painter did influence. So if the no was not there, we would say it is important, right, to recognize the influence. But because of no, we'll say it is not important. Now let's start looking at options, right? So it is by no means substantial. That is completely opposite to not important. And hence it is incorrect. We can st strike that through. Satisfying has nothing to do with the context, right? We are not talking about satisfying or unsatisfying. So option B is incorrect. Unimportant is best, right? That's basically not important. So we'll keep unimportant and appropriate. So again, we are looking at something negative to go along with no and appropriate will not work. Hence the best answer is option C, right? Now this is the normal way of doing things where you actually just get down into the fact that it's negative and uh, then you solve. But if you look at the prepto way, so whenever you have a negative term here, which can really just before the blank, which can make things more confusing, then remove the negative word. And then if an option fits, that option can be definitely eliminated. So let's try that technique, guys. If I remove the negative word and I say it is substantial to recognize and substantial works, right? Because the painter did have an influence on uh, Ali's paintings. So if substantial works by removing the negative, that means substantial is an incorrect option. Satisfying works a little, there's no context anyway, so option B can be eliminated. Option D can also be eliminated because it's a positive word. 
and so we know that our best answer is option C. So I hope we can see how we can save time in the prepped way, right? Great guys, moving on to the next section. Structure and purpose questions talk about how sentences are related to paragraphs or how two paragraphs work together. So let's quickly look at question types. Which choice best describes the function of the second sentence in the overall structure of the text? So we'll specifically look at what the second sentence is doing. Astronomers are confident that the star, Betel, whatever, right, will eventually consume all the helium in its core and explode. So they're confident. So this is something about which they are certain. They are much less confident, however, about when this will happen, since that depends on internal characteristics that are largely unknown. So they are confident it will happen. They are not confident about when. Astrophysicist Serafina recently investigated whether acoustic waves in the star could be used to determine internal stellar states but concluded that this method could not sufficiently reveal Betel's internal characteristics. So they are saying that okay we know it will explode but we are not sure when because we don't know these internal characteristics then this astrophysicist lands up and says okay we may use these waves to determine the internal stellar states but then you know finally the conclusion was that no it cannot be done. What the second sentence is doing it is stating the reason the third sentence is there right so it's giving us a problem it's giving us something that is not known and then the third sentence says okay it can be solved but concluding with it cannot be solved right so now we know what the second sentence is doing it is giving us the problem that the third sentence is trying to solve great now let's look at the questions it explains how the work of Nance and colleagues was received by others no, nothing has been spoken about how it has been received by other people. So this is out of context. It presents a central finding reported by Nance and colleagues. So there is no central finding here, right? There's only one thing that there's something they're confident about, something not confident about. There's no central finding that has been specifically stated. So this is incorrect. It identifies a problem that Nance and colleagues attempted to solve but did not, right? So this is perfect. This is stating the problem, what is not known. And the third sentence is trying to solve it, but they are not able to. So option C works, we'll keep it. It describes a serious limitation of the method. No, there is no limitation to the method, right? So option D is also incorrect and the best answer is option C. Great. Next question. Again, it's function of the third sentence in the overall structure. So let's see how this paragraph is structured. You have the mimosa tree that evolved in East Asia where a beetle, particular beetle, was spraying on its seeds. In 1785, these trees were taken to North America where there were no such beetles, far from any of these beetles, right? But evolutionary links between predators and their prey can persist across centuries and continents. So as soon as you read this, right, if you're reading actively, you realize what's going to happen. That even if you take the tree from East Asia to North America, the beetle is still going to attack, right? That's what it's saying that predator and prey, your beetle is the predator, your prey is the tree. And lo and behold, around 2001, the beetles were introduced in the same region, right? And within a year, 93% of the trees had been attacked by the beetles. So in some sense, this sentence is giving us a good idea of what is going to happen next, right? And uh, both the second and the fourth sentence is giving an example of how the third sentence is working, right? So the third sentence in some sense is a conclusion that can be based on the second and the fourth sentence, right? So with this in mind, let's start looking at options. It state the, states the hypothesis that Chang and colleagues had set out to investigate. They didn't set out to investigate any hypothesis, right? They were just monitoring mimosa trees. In that sense, option A is incorrect and can be struck out. It presents a generalization that is exemplified. Yeah, this is perfect, right? It presents a conclusion is what we were saying. And your second and the fourth sentence is the example. So this is a generalization. It's perfect. It offers an alternative explanation for the findings. There are no clear findings. They were just monitoring trees and they noticed that 93% of them were attacked. So there's no findings and there's no alternative explanation. There's only one explanation, right? That predator and prey can persist. It provides context that clarifies why the species mentioned, no, not at all, why they, the beetles or even the mimosa tree were moved from East Asia to North America, not clear, right? So C and D are both uh, out of scope 
and hence our answer is option B. Moving on to the fifth question in structure and purpose. Let's see what do we have. Based on the text, how would text 2 most likely respond to text 1's findings? Okay, so we are, we have to find out what this is and see how this is going to respond to this. Okay, when companies in the same industry propose merging, they often claim that the merger will benefit consumers by increasing efficiency and therefore lowering prices. Some economist investigated this. She modeled the hypothetical merger of Minneapolis area newspapers and found that subscription prices would rise following a merger. So what people, generally people say is that when you have a merger, you lower prices. One economist actually modeled it and said, no, prices are going to increase. So in text two, you have two other economists who argue that research on the effect of mergers have focused excessively on short-term effects, means what is just going to happen, which tend to be adverse for consumers. Using the case of, so they have an, their own example, right, consumer banking in Italy, they show that over the long term, several years, the efficiency gains realized do result. So what these guys are saying is, hey, you know what, this is short term, prices may go up, but in the long run, there is going to be some economic benefit for consumers. So mergers are beneficial, right? So they're not saying that, hey, this is wrong or you don't know what to do. They're saying you're just focusing on the short term. Let's focus on the long term. That's all they're saying, right? So now let's start looking at options. They would argue that over the long term, the expenses incurred by the merged newspaper company will also increase. No, in fact, over the long term, there's going to be economic benefit. So expenses most likely will not increase. So this is in fact going against what is given. They would recommend that FAN compare the near-term effect of a merger on subscription prices with the effect of a merger in another. No, this is not about one market or two markets. This is about short-term and long-term. So B is out of scope. They would encourage FAN to investigate whether the projected effect persists. Yeah, so now they are saying, right, extended period. So let's not look at short-term. Let's look at the long-term, right? So C is looking good. Let's keep C. They would claim that mergers have a different effect on consumer prices than, so again, there's no comparison between newspapers and saying how they're different from other industries, right? This is only about short term, long term, and hence the best answer is option C. The literature section should be your favorite because it saves time, the questions are easy, and you just need to focus on what is true. So if you do this the Prepto way, that is you first read the question, have an idea about what you want, and focus on what is true, you will save time on this section and get marks. So, let's first read the, the blurb before it. You have Jane Austen's novel Sense and Sensibility. This is an excerpt from there. Eleanor lives with her younger sisters and her mother, Mrs. Dashwood. So, Eleanor, this eldest daughter, whose advice was so effectual, possessed a strength of understanding and coolness of judgment which qualified her, though only 19, to be the counsellor of her mother. So, let's stop here, right? So she gave, she gave effective advice, she has strength of understanding, her judgment is cool, all these three things are positive, right? And even if she's only 19, she is advising her mother, counsellor of her mother means she's advising her mother. Now, enabled her frequently to counteract to the advantage of them all that eagerness of mind in Mrs. Dashwood, which must generally have led to imprudence. So Mrs. Dashwood is prone to being imprudent, right? This must be coming because she is not able to control her mind. So her mind is eager and she may be making wrong judgments. But Eleanor is able to counteract that, right, to the advantage of all of them, the younger sisters, Eleanor, etc. So again, this is a positive thing that she is able to manage her mother's imprudence. She had an excellent heart. Again, Eleanor had an excellent heart. Her disposition was affectionate. Her feelings were strong. But she knew how to govern them. She knew how to handle them. It was a knowledge which her mother had yet to learn and which one of her sisters had resolved never to be taught. So her mother did not control her emotions the way uh, Eleanor did and one of her sisters had resolved never to control her emotions, right? This is what it means. There's not a single word that is negative for Eleanor, right? Everything positive. Her mother, slightly there is uh, some negative thought, but again, that's very mildly put in. So what is true about Eleanor? That she's a great person, right? Okay. Let's start looking at option. Eleanor often argues with her mother, not at all. She's not arguing, right? So option A is incorrect. Fails to change her mind. Again, 
we know that she is giving advice whether her mother is listening to the advice or not we don't know so this is out of scope right so option a can be struck through can be overly sensitive not at all this is negative overly sensitive means she's far too sensitive that is negative there's nothing negative about eleanor so this is incorrect eleanor thinks her mother is a bad role model what eleanor is thinking is not mentioned right this is more or less about eleanor from a third person what eleanor is having in her mind we do not know so c is out of scope eleanor is remarkably mature for her age perfect this is so positive right so our best answer is option d moving on to the next question based on the text what is true about mrs o's acquaintances ochiltrees so this is adapted from Charles uh, Chestnut's novel, The Marrow of Tradition. Mrs. Ochiltree was a woman of strong individuality, so she's a strong individual, whose comments upon her acquaintances, present or absent, whether the acquaintances were there or not there, were marked by a frankness at times no less than startling. So she's too frank, too honest, right? Which means that if the people were present, they may take offense. She may be giving offense to people. This characteristic caused her to be more or less avoided. Obviously, if she's going to be too frank, people don't want to hear honest opinions about themselves. So people will avoid her. Mrs. Ochiltree was aware of this sentiment. So she knew that people didn't want to meet her that much and rather exulted. Exulted means she took, uh, you know, some joy out of it. So great. Uh, what is true about her, the acquaintances will avoid her. That is what is true, right? So they try to refrain from discussing topics. Not at all. They don't want to meet her. So what they will discuss or not is out of scope. They are unable to spend as much time as she would like. Not at all. We don't know whether Mrs. Ochiltree would like to meet them. In fact, here it's very clearly mentioned that when they avoid her, she takes joy out of it, right? So option B is incorrect. They're too preoccupied. What they are preoccupied with is out of scope. They are going to be offended by. That's why they're avoiding, right? So D is definitely true and answer is option D. Last question in this section. What is the main idea of the text? That is the question. Yeah, so keeping that in mind, let's read. The following text is adapted from William Shakespeare's poem, Sony 27. It's addressed to a close friend as if he were physically present. So most probably the friend is not present. Very with toil, so tired from work, right? That's the modern day interpretation. I hurry to my bed, so I'm tired, so I go to bed. The deer repose for limbs with travel tired. So my limbs are tired and they need some rest, right? So they are tired with the travel and I'm giving them some rest. But then begins a journey in my head. So physically I'm tired, but mentally I'm taking a journey to work my mind when body's work expired. So my mind is now working, body has finished its uh, work. From then my thoughts from far where I abide. So my thoughts are from far I mean, where I abide, where I am, from there my thoughts go far and they begin a pilgrimage to thee. Thee is the friend who is not physically present. So mentally the thoughts go there and the eyelids that were going to sleep open wide. So this person has not slept. So the main idea is that there is a friend who is not present. My body is tired, but as soon as I lie down, mentally my thoughts go to that friend. That's all, right? It's a very simple main idea. Let's see what the options talk about. The speaker is asleep. No, the speaker is not asleep. This is incorrect. Eyes are wide open. Okay. The speaker is planning an upcoming trip. There's no nothing about the future. It's about right now when the mind is making a journey mentally, right? The speaker is too fatigued to continue a discussion. The friend is not even there. There is no discussion with a friend. The mind is going, the thoughts are going towards a friend. The speaker is thinking about the friend instead of immediately falling asleep. D is perfect. So answer in this case is option D. Moving on to the next section. This is one of the tougher sections, critical reasoning and quantitative evidence. Here, sometimes you have to move beyond the text to strengthen a claim, right? So let's look at the first question here. Again, always the prepto way, we'll focus on the question first so that we know what we are looking for and then read the paragraph. So which finding from Granito and Alvarez's research, if true, would most directly support their claim? So black beans are a nutritionally dense food. So there's a lot of nutrition in them, but they are difficult to digest in part because of their high levels of soluble fiber and compounds like raffinose. 
and they also contain anti nutrients like tannins and trypsin inhibitors okay which interfere with the body's ability to extract nutrients from foods so till now we don't know uh, where these guys are right granito and alvarez it's just black beans okay they are nutritionally dense but because of four things right what four things soluble fiber the raffinose compound anti nutrients like tannins and trypsin they are difficult to digest in a res research article granito and alvarez from the simon university claim that inducing fermentation of black beans improves the digestibility of the beans and makes them more nutritious so that's it right you start by stating black beans are not easy to digest because of four problems and then these guys say that if i do fermentation i can make them more nutritious which means in some way they are dealing with the four problems right so critical reasoning questions if you focus on the basics can sometimes be quite mathematical and quite logical so here we see right that from the first sentence we have found out four problems the second sentence says hey you know what fermentation makes them nutritious so fermentation can handle the four problems that is what i need to directly support their claim right great let's start with options when cooked fermented beans contain significantly more oh no so this is bad right because it's increasing one of the problem areas right significantly less this is good because soluble fiber is a problem and if you have less of it good but it is definitely increasing some of the problems so it is not a good option but right now we'll keep it partly because there is some improvement right soluble fiber it is decreasing let's look at the second option fermented beans contained less soluble fiber soluble fiber great and raffinose and when cooked there was a reduction in trypsin and tannins this is perfect all the four problems are reduced soluble fiber check raffinose check trypsin check tannins check so b is definitely a better option than a we can now eliminate a and look at c and d when the fermented beans were analyzed they were found to contain two microorganisms uh, and that is increasing the amount of nitrogen all this is out of scope because what nitrogen will do we have no idea right so nitrogen is also not spoken about so you can eliminate option c and you can strike it through both fermented and non fermented contained significantly fewer after being cooked at high pressure so first of all it is not presenting a case for fermented right there's no differentiation that is there in option b so d does not look so good secondly it's only talking about two problems and not about the soluble fiber so again in the absence of b we may have gone for d but a is definitely better right because d is not making any distinction between fermentation and non fermentation but b is so good right that we'll go ahead with option b great next question so we have a table this is a quantitative evidence question and what is our question we need to use the data to complete this example so this is what we need to fill in so great let's go about this ablation rates for three elements so you have these three elements iron potassium sodium right and by dust source cosmic so there are four sources and you have three elements great now what the four sources are is given earth's atmosphere is bombarded by cosmic dust originating from several sources there is species which is short period comets ASTs HTCs anyways we don't want to do a phd in science i am just going to say okay there are four sources these are the four sources right some of the dust material vaporizes in the atmosphere in a process called ablation so ablation is how they vaporize and the faster the particles move the higher the rate of ablation astrophysicists led a team that calculated average ablation rates for elements in the dust and showed that material in slower moving spc or ast right so what is slower moving we know that if the particles move fast they vaporize also the higher rate of ablation is there if it is slow moving which is your spc and ast then there is going to be a lower rate of vaporizing right so for example compared to, so spc ast is slower moving compared to the faster moving htc or occ so we can clearly draw this line this is slow moving so there are lower rates you can check right 2028 is substantially less compared to 1998 4474 is substantially less here so you have 100% so 
So these numbers are less compared to these two numbers, right? So now they have made this statement that SPC AS, AST is slower moving, HTC OCC is faster, and this they want to show with an example. For example, right, average ablation rate for iron from AST is 28, right? So I need to show, okay, AST is slower moving. I need to compare it with a faster moving thing, which means I need a number from either SPC or, sorry, not SPC, from either HTC or OCC. These two are faster moving, right? So to contrast, I need a number from that and I need to contrast it only with iron, right? There's no point contrasting it with potassium or sodium because anyways, each element will have its own different rate. To show faster and slower, right? This is slower, this is faster. I need to compare AST with one of HTC or OCC. So even before I look at options, I know that the answer will have to be one of average rate for HTC, right? Is 90%. This is one possibility. Or average rate for OCC is 98%. So we want one of these. And this is so mathematical. If you now start looking at options, you're not going to compare AST with SPC. They are both slower moving. You're not going to compare iron with sodium. So option B is out. C is best, right? This is one of our options. We'll keep C. And D, again, you're comparing iron with sodium. So that's incorrect, right? So your answer is C. Moving on, guys. This is another quantitative aptitude question. Again, using the Prepto way, guys, we'll just quickly read the question. Which choice effectively uses the data to illustrate this claim? Right? So we need to complete this sentence so that we can illustrate the claim. High levels of public uncertainty about which economic policies a country will adopt can make planning difficult for businesses. Okay, so if there's uncertainty, it's difficult to plan, right? And such measures are not, ten, are not usually very detailed. So recently, however, an economist anal analyzed trends in news reports to derive measures not only for general economic policy uncertainty, but also for uncertainty related to other areas of economic policy like tax or trade. So this economist, right, the, came up with three measures. One is general, one is tax, and one is trade, right? And this is what the graph is about. So you have the economic policy uncertainty in the United Kingdom from 2005 till 2010. And for each of the years, you have uncertainty in tax first and then uncertainty in trade and then a general uncertainty. Okay. Now, what is the final conclusion? One revelation of her work is that a general measure may not fully reflect uncertainty about specific areas. Right. So what she's saying is that your general uncertainty, which is always the third column, may not fully reflect uncertainty in the other two columns. Okay, so I want some figures where your third column is substantially different from the other two columns, right? Where general economic policy uncertainty, and this is where I need to fill in. So if you notice the graph, okay, 2007, 8, and 9, these three numbers, for the three columns, they are all very similar. So doing any comparison for these three years is not going to tell us how general is different from the other areas of policy. So any option that deals with 2009, right, or 2007, or 2008, is not going to be a good option. I need to somehow look at 5 or maybe 6. 6 also, they are a little close. But 5 and 10 are the best, where the general policy is very different from some of the other policies. Great. So let's look at the options. Aligned closely with uncertainty about tax and public spending in 2005. So general economic policy is aligned closely with tax and public spending in 2005. Right. So this is general, the third column, and this is tax, and they are aligned closely, but differed from uncertainty about tax and public spending, which is the same, by a large amount in 2009. No, nothing in 2009 was different. So A is actually incorrect and can be struck through. Okay. B was substantially lower than uncertainty about tax and public spending each year from 2005. No, not at all, right? And let me just clear the graph so that we can see this better. We are saying that general policy was substantially lower than tax and public for each of the years. That's not true, right? 
tax and public is the first in this year it is lower but in this year it's higher so straight away option b is incorrect and can be eliminated reached its highest level between 2005 and 2010 in the same year that uncertainty about trade policy and tax reached their lowest level so they're saying the general was highest so where is general highest general is highest in the last year right so in the last year when it was the highest can i say that trade policy and tax policy was lowest no in fact definitely tax policy was highest so c is also incorrect right d was substantially lower than uncertainty about trade policy in 2005 this is true this is trade policy and this is general and we can see it is substantially lower and substantially higher than the same trade policy in 2010 this is perfect right you can see the second column is too low and the third column is high so d is correct this shows how the general uh, uncertainty is not reflective of trade policy uncertainty because in 2005 and in 2010 it's substantially different right so option d is best and that's the correct answer next question another quantitative evidence question with a table let's see what the question is which choice best describes data from the table that supports the hypothesis right so we need to support the researcher's hypothesis what is the table about you have average number and duration of torpor bouts right and arousal episodes for two animals marmots and squirrels so when hibernating marmots and squirrels enter a state called torpor which minimizes the energy their bodies need to function so you can think of it as some sort of a deep sleep right often a hibernating animal will temporarily come out of this deep sleep and that's called an arousal episode and its metabolic rate will rise burning more of the precious energy the animal needs to survive the winter right so it survives winter in two phases either it is sleeping right deep sleep torpor or there is an arousal going on and while it is sleeping the metabolic rate is low less energy is burned while it's awake the metabolic rate is high marmots hibernate in groups and therefore they burn less energy keeping warm so while they are sleeping they sleep in groups so they burn less energy being warm whereas squirrels hibernate alone so they would be burning more energy even while sleeping compared to marmots right so they would likely exhibit longer sleep and shorter arousal episodes right than marmots so because marmots burn less energy right while sleeping they can stay awake longer is what it is saying right they can stay awake longer compared to squirrels okay and that is a researcher's hypothesis and this is what we need to prove from the data so let us look at the table if you see for marmots the bouts are 12 right and duration per bout is 13 whereas for the arctic squirrels the bouts are fewer but the duration per bout is far more so they sleep more per bout right arousal episodes are more for marmots and the duration is also more whereas for squirrels who are sleeping alone right they are awake for lesser number of times and the duration per the awakening episode is also less so that is the data right the data is also supporting that since squirrels are sleeping alone they are burning more energy while they are sleeping so they are awake less compared to marmots so we have all that data now let's start looking at options the marmots arousal episodes lasted for days while the squirrels episode lasted less than a day that is not true right it's both are you know each of the episodes are less than a day so this is in fact incorrect so we can strike this through option b the marmots and the squirrels both so see we need to support the table we need to have a comparison between marmots and squirrels any option that says both right is not going to help us support any hypothesis so option b we can straight away eliminate the marmots had shorter torpor bouts bouts and longer arousal episodes than the squirrels did so that is very clear right these bouts torpor bouts are shorter compared to the squirrels and 
the arousal bouts are longer compared to squirrels and that is what we want to show that since they're saving energy because they sleep in groups they will be awake longer so we'll keep see the marmots had more torpor bouts than arousal episodes okay but there so again see now i need to compare the two and d is only talking about marmots there are no squirrels anywhere so option d can be eliminated and hence your answer is option c right great guys 12th question sorry 13th question Again, another table. Let's see what the question is. Which choice most effectively uses data? We need to complete the statement. What is the data about? Employment by sector in France and the US from 1800 to 2012 as a percentage of total population, right? So you can see the years are 1800 to 2012. You have France, manufacturing, agriculture, so agricultural manufacturing services, and then you have US, agriculture manufacturing services right uh, rows and table may not add up to 100 over the past 200 years which we already know 1800 to 2000 the percentage of the population employed in the agricultural sector has declined in both france and us so agriculture starts from 64 declines to 3 in france and starts from 68 and declines to 2 in the us right while employment in the service sector which includes retail, consulting, real estate has risen. However, this transition, so till now, things are similar for both US and France, but well, as soon as you see this, however, right, you know there's something going to change. This transition happened at very different rates in the two countries. So you want to say, okay, 64 becomes 3, 68 also becomes 2. That is similar, right? It's not exactly the same, but it's similar. But the rate at which it drops is different that's what it's saying right this transition happened at different rates and i want data from the table which helps me to show that difference right so if i look at the 1800 data for agriculture and now we're just concerned about agriculture right it's not talking about how services has gone up or what's happening in manufacturing these two tables uh, columns rather are immaterial for both France and US, okay? So I want to show that it has dropped at different rates, the agricultural part. And even before we look at options, let's see if I can see that drop, right? Different drop in both the countries. So 1800 for France and US, similar, right? 64 and 68, two similar numbers. 1900 is 43, 41, again, two similar numbers. But if you see 1950, right? you have 32 and 14. So the transition from 43 to 32 is less compared to 41 and 14, right? This is a very big transition. And 2012 numbers is very similar again. So any option that is the right option will talk about how 1950 played a role, right? This is 1950 data. So it, the comparison may either be a transition from 1900 to 1950 or we can also transition from 1950 to 2012 saying that this is a sizable drop and this is a smaller drop right but my answer right our answer should have 1950 otherwise there is no difference in any of the other figures no difference no difference no difference okay so let's quickly scan options 1900 with 1950 this is looking good let's keep option a 1800 with 2012 not at all, I need 1950. C also, similarly, you can strike through. D also can be struck through. So our answer is option A. That's the only option which has 1950. And without 1950, we can't bring about the different rate transition, right? Great, guys, 14th question. Which choice most logically completes the text? Euphorbia esula, leafy spurge, is a Eurasian plant that has become invasive in North America where it displaces native vegetation and sickens cattle, okay? So there is a E. isula, okay? It's a Eurasian plant that is now in America and it is invasive. Invasive means that it's taking over, it's invading. So it's, display, it's removing native vegetation and it is sickening the cattle, right? And it's taking over things. E. isula can be controlled with chemical herbicides, but that approach also kills harmless plants nearby. So if I put chemical uh, herbicides on this plant, other plants around it also suffer. Recent research on introducing engineered DNA into plant species to inhibit their reproduction 
may offer a path towards exclusively targeting esola right so let's use the prep to approach guys before we look at the options let's fill in the blank with what will work best so if they are inhibiting their reproduction and exclusively targeting if it's exclusively targeting that means it is not targeting the other plants what is the problem right now that we are facing that harmless plants nearby are also targeted exclusive targeting means harmless plants around it will not be targeted that's all right so you have some method now in which plants around it can actually be saved so now let's start looking at option individual more susceptible i mean that would actually be great but this is not talking about how the plants become more susceptible right enhancing the ecological benefits in north ecological is actually quite out of scope we have not had ecological benefits here spoken about at all enabling cattle to consume without becoming sick so whatever dna engineering dna ha is happening is happening into plant species it's not happening within cattle right so again what is happening to cattle is out of scope reducing invasive numbers without so this is perfect this is what we said right that when it's exclusively targeting e dot isula that means it is not targeting other harmless plants right so option d is best and uh, let's move on to the next section guys grammar and punctuation as we know is a time saving section let's quickly revise the prepto way of going about it here we don't have to focus so much on the question because the question is always the same conforms to the conventions of standard english what we start with is by focusing on the options so if you see the options here company and comma company without comma and then company with that company without that so the focus is on punctuation and the focus is on whether we will use that or not right so once you know what you are looking for you can already start thinking about what you need to look for in the paragraph so for instance here you need to see whether there is a phrase there is a proper main clause or not right once you have these things in mind you can start looking at the paragraph while we read always remember that you don't need to focus that much on proper nouns you don't need to focus that much on what is modifying right we need to focus more on verbs we need to fo focus on whether the verbs are agreeing with the subject the pronouns are agreeing with their with what nouns they are replacing and we also need to check for main clause etc okay so both sona an indian american and dhoniel an african american grew up frustrated by the lack of diverse characters in books so in 2011 these two writers joined forces to found cake literary what is cake literary it's a book packaging company so company is there always right so now after the comma what you have is a phrase right it's modifying what cake literary is so what is cake literary it's a book packaging company right and book packaging company there is more information from the fact that it specializes in the creation and promotion so i need that to give us more information about the company right so we can eliminate option c and option a because i can't say a book packaging company specializes in right i need this relative modifier so it is going to ha have a that and since this whole specializes in is modifying the company i cannot separate it with a comma hence the best answer is option b company that specializes in it's a continuous phrase right you do not need a comma great next question again first thing we'll start with is by looking at options right so you see that options are it they this some so first of all it and this are singular they and some are plural right you can see all of them are in the past right so we need to check which pronoun is going to come whether the subject is going to be singular whether it's going to be plural the tense is not that important because the tense is always in the past so i hope you can see how in this prepto way we can focus more on what we are looking for we are not looking for tense we are looking for the subject and whether it's singular or plural so let's start off in 1930 japanese american artist depicted the natural beauty of this park 
in two memorable woodcuts right this is the first woodcut which is evening and the second woodcut is lake basin so you see we do not care about most of these proper nouns there are two woodcuts woodcut a and woodcut b in 2019 these woodcuts right so there we need a plural subject these woodcuts were exhibited so of course there is no these and we cannot have some because both the woodcuts were exhibited right if there were 10 woodcuts and some of them perhaps and then you would have some of them some itself is not going to work and of course it's not singular so a and c will not work hence our answer is going to be option b they were exhibited right plural subject great next question again we we'll look at options and we see that you have essays praising and then you have comma and and a full stop so mostly this is going to be completely a punctuation question which means we need to check whether we have two main clauses right which means whether we have two sentences okay or whether we have one main clause with a phrase right a phrase will not have a proper subject so if you have two main clauses right how can we join two main clauses you can join them with a semicolon or you can join them with a comma and one of the conjunctions from fanboys or you can also join them with a full stop okay if instead you have one main clause and a phrase then a comma will be sufficient so let's start reading guys american writer edgewich who emigrated from haiti in 1981 has won acclaim right for her powerful short stories novels and essays so we know that essays are going to come here so she has won a claim for a b and c right and praising her lyrical yet unflinching depictions of her native country's turbulent history writer robert antony has compared so who is praising see she is writing she has won a claim right so she has won a claim for a b and c and then when i say and praising the list completely changes right right now you have one acclaim for a proper noun a uh, sorry for noun a which is powerful short stories one acclaim for b which is novels and one acclaims for one acclaim for c which is essays right but when i put praising i'm putting a verb so i cannot have and praising at all praising is a part of the next sentence because somebody else is praising her robert antony has praising her right so praising her lyrical yet unflinching depictions robert antony has compared edgewich to somebody else so you have two main clauses and you can join these two main clauses as i said as two sentences which is there as option d or you can have a comma with an and which we do not have or you can have a semicolon again which we do not have right a simple and here would make it another list and that as we said is problematic so answer is going to be option d 18th question again you have bounds you have a comma you have helped helping that helped so this is more about the verb it's partly a little bit about punctuation but you can see that helped helping that help to help so let's see how we can decrease confusion by using the prepto way in 1966 emmet ashford became the first african american to umpire a major league basketball game sentence is over right his energetic gestures announcing when a player had struck out and his habit of barreling after a hit ball to see if it would land out of bounds of course bounds is there right helped transform so you see his a and his b what is his a energetic gestures and his habit these two things these two together make the subject these two things helped right transform the traditional so i need a past tense verb and i need a proper finite main verb i cannot have to help because then there is no main verb i cannot have that helped right i cannot have helping because it's in the past he became right this is everything is in the past so yeah our best answer is option a so one way to reduce confusion is to really shorten the subject so you say his energetic gestures is you know his a and his b helped transform the traditionally so you can see right once you reduce the subject then it's very easy to see what the verb is 
right? So here the answer is option A. Moving on. 19th question. Let's stick to the Prepto way. Look at the options. You have gingerbread with an N dash, with a comma, with a colon. So it's a punctuation question. Let's look at the paragraph. In crafting a fantasy fiction, Nigerian-born author has drawn inspiration from the classic fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm. A 2014 novel, Boy Snowbird, for instance, is a complex retelling of the story of Snow White. While her 2019 novel, Gingerbread, right, that's what we want here, offers a delicious twist on the classic tale. So we can see that offers is the verb for the subject and the subject is not just the novel. Her 2019 novel, Gingerbread, that the whole thing is the subject and you cannot have a comma or a punctuation mark that is separating the subject with the verb, right? So our answer cannot be A or B or D, our answer will be option C. Also remember that you, if you have an N dash, you should have an N dash before also. So in that sense, option A is definitely wrong, right? Um, a colon is to define or to give a list and neither are you defining what the novel is or you, neither are you giving a list. So option D is out. Now as far as B or C go, you can also use this, the first clause, as to get an idea about how this clause will also pan out, right? So if you see her 2014 novel, Boy Snowbird, so Boy Snowbird has commas because the title itself has commas, right? And this comma and this comma, they are setting off the for instance. So by itself, the title does not have a comma. And hence, even gingerbread will also not have a comma. So you can look at that also. You can stick to basic grammar, right? Comparing the earlier uh, clause with this clause is also a great way and a prepto way of dealing with this question. The answer will be option C, right? Great, 20th question. Look at the options. You have those, one, them and it. It's a pronoun question. We need to focus on what the pronoun is replacing, right? What noun it is replacing and ensure that it sticks in gender and number. So violence handmade in the 17th century by Italian craftsman Antonio have been celebrated as some of the finest. In close collaboration with musicians, Stradivari introduced changes to the shape of a traditional violin, flattening some of the instrument's curves. So this is the instrument's curves that are being flattened, right? And making the instrument lighter overall. So it's the instrument that is going to be, the curves are not going to be lighter, the shape is not going to be, the, is not going to be lighter, it's the instrument and hence it is a singular pronoun. So those is out, them is out, it's a subject uh, instrument making it lighter overall. So it's actually the object, right? And hence your answer is option D. Again, options as usual. So you have antiquity, however, and then there are commas and semicolons. Sometimes like here, there is no punctuation also. So this is basically a question on punctuation. And since the clear distinguishing uh, punctuation marks that they are using, the clear marks are comma and semicolon. That means somewhere I need to decide between whether I have two main clauses in the sentence or do I have a main clause with a participle clause or a phrase, right? And let's start reading. During the English neoclassical period, many writers imitated the epic poetry and satires of ancient Greece. They were not the first in England to adopt. Some of the most prominent figures of the earlier Renaissance period were also influenced by ancient Greek and Roman literature. So you have, they were not the first in England to adopt the literary modes of classical antiquity, right? However is also there, so we don't know where however goes. And then you have some of the most prominent, so there are definitely two main clauses, right? I can have a full sentence somewhere here, they were not the first to adopt, full stop. Some of the most prominent figures were also influenced full stop. So I definitely need a semicolon. There are two main clauses and a comma cannot join them. So we need a semicolon. And hence we are looking at either option C or D. Option A and B can be eliminated. Right? Now, where will the semicolon come is basically where will our first sentence end, first main clause end. So however, whether it's a part of the first main clause or the second main clause, that will determine our answer. So you, again, if you start reading, many writers imitated the epic poetry. 
However, they were not the first in England. So I need actually, however, your, however, could either come in the beginning or they were not the first in England to adopt, however, right? And then the second main clause, some of the most were also influenced. Some of the most prominent figures of the earlier Renaissance period were also influenced by ancient Greek and Roman literature. So the second main clause will not have the however, it's only the first one will have it. So your semicolon will come after however because it is the part of the first main clause and hence our answer is option C and not option D. Option D can be eliminated. Great guys, moving on to the next section. Logical transitions is a fun section where you just need to focus on the logic of the whole paragraph. So the prep to way guys is to understand how it flows. Logical transitions is all about having sentences that either agree with each other, right? In which case you may have options like likewise and therefore or in other words as possible answers. Or it can be about sentences that go against each other or that <clears throat> give us information that does not match what has already been told. In which case you may go ahead with something like nevertheless. You may also have an example given. So then you'd be looking like uh, you'd be looking at for instance as a possible answer. Or you may have a conclusion given, right? So you can have an in conclusion as an option. So mostly just focusing on the flow. You don't need to get into the grammar of things. You don't need to get into the proper nouns, of course, right? You just need to focus on the verb and on the flow. So let's start off with the first one. One poll taken after the first 1960 presidential debate suggested that John Kennedy lost badly. Only 21% of those who listened on the radio rated him the winner. So the radio listeners felt that Kennedy lost the debate, right? Now, this is what we are looking for as the answer. The debate was ultimately considered a victory. So you can see that the flow is changing. In the first part of the paragraph, right, we can see that people did not think John Kennedy did well. They thought John Kennedy lost badly. But in the second part, we are saying it was considered a victory. So we want a contrast here, right? And hence, D looks best. In other words, therefore, likewise will not work. Let's substitute D and read the whole sentence. Nevertheless, the debate was ultimately considered a victory for the telegenic. Telegenic means he looks good on TV, right? Who rated higher than his opponent among those watching on the new medium of television. So radio people felt didn't do well. On the other hand, nevertheless, it was finally a victory because people on TV found him good looking, right? So our answer here is option D. You can see how Prepto really just distills the whole method into a very easy way to solve questions. Great. Next, again, we'll focus on the flow. In November 1934, Amrita Shergill was living in, most, in what must have seemed like the ideal city for a young artist, Paris. She was studying firsthand the color-saturated style of France's modernist masters and beginning to make a name for herself. So from the first sentence and to the second, the flow is in the same direction. Now we need to find a word here. Shergil longed to return to her childhood home. If things are so great in Paris, then it, and she is longing to return to her childhood home in India, that means there is a contrast somewhere that we need. Right? That despite... The great place that she... So, you see, I have to use despite. So, if I look at these options, right, I don't need a therefore. I don't need a furthermore because these are all in the same direction, right? I need a contrast and that contrast can only come from still. Correct? That she was in Paris where she was studying firsthand. Still, she longed to return to her childhood home of India. So, here the answer is going to be option A. The others will continue the flow. Only A introduces the contrast. 24th question. In his 1925 book, The Morphology of Landscape, U.S. geographer challenged prevailing views about how natural landscapes influence human cultures. Right? So, he's just talking about how natural landscapes influence human cultures. The same Sawyer argued that instead of being shaped entirely by their natural surroundings, cultures play an active role, right, by virtue of the interaction. So, this is definitely in the same flow, in the same vein, it's continuing. Here you have a general statement and here he's getting down to the nitty-gritties of how he's challenging. So here the challenge is explained in more detail. There is something specific here. So option D works. There is no similarly. 
you are not restating this in some other words or you're not giving another example for the first sentence so similarly is out there is no conclusion therefore you can eliminate finally and therefore and hence the answer is option d now here's another prepto trick guys if you have both finally and therefore as options most probably they both are incorrect if you can replace finally you can also replace finally with therefore right so anyways it regardless of what the paragraph is option b and c can be eliminated you're just looking at a or d and then you need to decide whether there's a similar example or whether there's a specific detail in our question we have a specific detail so the answer is option d moving on guys although those who migrated to california so this question as you can see it already starts with a contrast word although right so those who migrated in California dreamed of finding gold nuggets in stream beds. The state's richest deposits were buried deeply in rock beyond the reach of individual prospectors, right? So by 1952, many had given up their fortune hunting dreams and gone to work for one of the large companies, right? So if you see, you're already starting with a contrast word. And from there, it's a logical thought, right? That although a lot of individual people had gone, because it was not easy to mine, they ended up joining, right? Hence, they ended up joining large companies. So I want a so or a hence or something here, right? Which is a continuation. Now, if I look at the options, I cannot have a still, which is a contrast word, right? I cannot have further, more or next because these are continuations in some sort of event timeline, right? This is just a continuation of logical thought. The best replacement for words like hence and so that we used while talking is consequently. And hence the best answer is option C. And here's the prepto tip, guys. Furthermore and next, they mean the same thing, right? If I'm talking about events, I can say furthermore this happened or next this happened. Since they are both similar, they both cannot be the answer because if I can use furthermore, I can easily use next. So A and D can be straight away eliminated and you just need to find out whether you need a still which you would use as a contrast or whether you need a consequently which you would use as a continuation of the flow and here we need continuation. So answer is option C. This next section in writing rhetorical synthesis or notes taking is an easy section. Again, please remember guys the prepto way first read the question. The student wants to present the Kwan Hukun study and its conclusions. So which choice does that? So remember we need to find out what the study is and the conclusions. So while reading their notes, focus on both these things, right? In 2013, an archaeologist studied cat bone fragments that they had found in the ruins of Kwan Hukun, a Chinese farming village. So this is the study, right? They, that they studied cat bone fragments that they had found. The fragments were estimated to be 5,300 years old. That is the first conclusion, right? A chemical analysis of the fragments revealed that the cats had consumed large amounts of grain. The grain consumption is evidence that the Kwan Hukun cats may have been domesticated. So this is the first conclusion and this is the second conclusion. Right? So we want both the conclusions and we want the study. This should not be difficult. Let's start looking at options. As a part of 2013 study of cat domestication. So first of all, this itself is wrong. The study was not about domestication. The study was about the cat bone fragments and then they were found to be domesticated, right? Anyways, let's finish. A chemical analysis was conducted on cat bone fragments. So this is wrong study first and conclusions are not there. How old they were and the fact that they were domesticated, right? So option A is incorrect and incomplete and it can be eliminated. Option B, an, a 2013 analysis of cat bone fragments, correct, studies correct, suggests that cat there may have been domesticated 5,300 years ago. Perfect, right? It gives the first conclusion about how old the bone fragments were and the fact that they were domesticated. So we'll keep option B. Option B is looking very good. In 2013, archaeologists studied what cats in Kwan Hukun, China had eaten. No, so the study was not about what cats had eaten. The study was about the bone fragments. So this is incorrect. And again, there is no conclusion about the study. So it's incomplete as well. Option C can be struck through. 
cat bone fragments estimated to be 5300 years old were found so again this is incomplete domestication not mentioned right the fact that they were studied not mentioned so our best answer here is option b great guys next question main question the student wants to emphasize a difference in the origins of the two words which choice most effectively uses relevant information to accomplish this goal right so i want to emphasize the difference in the origins okay so quickly let's go through our notes started in 1925 the national spelling bee is a us based spelling competition okay the words used in the competition have diverse linguistic origins 2008 samir mishra won by correctly spelling the word guerdon guerdon derives from the anglo french word guerdon in 2009 kavya shiv shankar won by correctly spelling the word laodician and laodician derives from the ancient greek word laodikia so the diverse origin right is basically the difference of in the origins comes from one word anglo french and the other word ancient greek right so i need to mention both if i don't mention both i am not emphasizing the difference right so i want an option that mentions both the words mentions the difference in origins great now let's start looking at options guerdon the final word is of anglo french origin correct while the following years final word derives from ancient greek correct so it brings about the the difference in the origins option a is looking good let's keep it option b in 2008 samir mishra won by correctly spelling okay however the following year kavya shankar won based on spelling the word no this is not about who won this is about origin uh, of the word and the difference in the origins and that has not been spoken about at all so this option is definitely incomplete and can be struck through kavya shiv shankar won the 2009 spellings b by correctly spelling laudition so this is correct but this is again incomplete i don't just want kavya shiv shankar's word right i want the other word also i want both the words and both their origins to be brought about one word and its origin is not bringing about the difference in the origin so option c can be eliminated the scripps national national spelling bee uses words from diverse linguistic origins such as a and b but what those origins are not mentioned right if you don't mention the origins you are not bringing about the difference option d is also incorrect and our best answer is option a so guys i hope you enjoyed the walk through and i hope this made the process of your sat preparation more easy best of luck for your exams thank you and see you soon bye bye coming up at prepto we have more walk throughs of college boards practice tests and questions in the prepto way and a self paced digital sat course that includes a free adaptive diagnostic test and a free first session so don't forget to sign up with the link in the description hey prepters thank you so much for watching our video make sure to like subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss a video again here's a video that we think you might like and click here for the full walk through playlist so you can prepare for the sat the prepto way